rolling. Here we go. It's Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, so you know what that means. It's time for another episode of Hashtag Event Icons. Presented by Endless Events. The show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. Use the question panel on the webinar to submit your questions. Or you can hop on Twitter. Submit your questions with hashtag event icons. We'll be answering your questions live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better conversation we can have. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter and Facebook. Just tell your friends to watch at www.event-icons.com. Dot com. Now, without any further delay, this is Hashtag Event Icons. Woohoo! <laughs> Hello, everybody out there in the interwebs. Event Icons, episode 103. Man, it is amazing how time flies. We're already on episode 103. And today, we have an amazing topic. I mean, when do we not have an amazing topic? Let's be honest. But today, we're talking about creative event team, which you may have never heard of. To be honest, I had never heard of them before I heard of them. Um, and we're going to be talking a little bit about what makes them different than other event agencies, <laughs> associations. Sometimes I talk a little too fast for my own good. So today, we're joined by an amazing uh, group of panelists on the show. Two people that I know very well and have known now for about three years or so. Has it been? Yeah, it goes fast, doesn't years. it? Time flies. And so um, to give some full disclosure, I am actually a part of Creative Event Team. Um, and I've known these guys for a very long period of time. Terry and Tracy are the reasons why I joined the organization. And so I knew they had to be on here to try and talk about the organization. And ironically, basically, they run it now. So, um, <laughs> so that's what's awesome about it. But we'll talk a little bit about what Creative Event Team is. But I got to introduce these guys so you can meet them, let them tell their stories. Let's start off with... Uh, Tracy Fuller. Tracy's actually, uh, I've known Tracy for a while. She was actually a viewer, a reader, just like you guys out on the blog sphere. And we or got stalker. <laughs> stalker. Of, I mean, to be honest, I probably stalked you a little bit like <laughs> marketing, but um, reached out to Tracy and she actually uh, worked together on a couple of events and she said, Hey, there's this creative event team. Would you be interested in joining? And at the time, I was like, I'll do anything to get your business, Tracy. Yes, I'll, I'll have this conversation, not well knowing anything about networking organizations or what CET was. And to be honest, I was pretty anti networking organizations when I wanted to join or when I was looking to join. So it was a tough sell, but Tracy convinced me. Um, and Tracy actually owns her own events agency, Innovative Events uh, in Des Moines. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I always forget if it's Des Moines or the other one, but Des Moines, Des Moines Iowa, Iowa. Um, yeah. which is doing some really crazy, amazing things. Um, I'll let you tell your story in a little bit, but Tracy, thank okay. you so much for, uh, for joining us. Thank you. And also joining part of the second equation, the guy who eventually badgered me every day with phone calls, getting me to <laughs> yeah. join the organization, Mr. Terry Quick. Terry owns an event agency in Seattle, Washington. He's the master of negotiating hotels and venues. So if you're ever looking to get a good venue at a good price, make sure your room rates are low. Terry's the guy to know. Uh, Terry was an absolutely amazing big part of CET as well. He's the executive director. He's been in the organization for a very long time, so I'm excited to hear a little bit of the history behind it. Um, but thank you for so much joining us, uh, Terry. Thanks for having me, Will. Appreciate it. All right. So, um, you know, obviously we're going to talk about creative venting, but I do want to give everyone a little bit of a background into how you guys started your companies and how you got into the industry. So, uh, Tracy, ladies first, why don't you tell a little bit about what got you in the events industry today? Oh, gosh. Well, my story has got a little bit of a um, sad start. My son passed away and I needed a way to get off the couch. And so I started concentrating on other people's happy occasions. And that's what I called the first company was happy occasions. And as we got into a lot of the corporate work, that name didn't fit anymore. So we had to change names. And that's where we came up with innovative events. That was about 10 years into um, the business and we were definitely in corporate. In fact, I'd ran into somebody that taught me the production world, AV lighting, which I love lighting because I think it makes everything awesome and uh, sound and, and um, that's how I got into it. I just learned, I learned backstage management. I learned how to produce a show and the rest is kind of history. Awesome. I love it. And yeah. can you give everyone a little bit of an idea what are, so obviously you're doing a little bit bigger events than when you're first doing. Can you talk a little bit about what you specialize in now? 
Well, we specialize in corporate production. So um, kind of managing the whole show. Uh, we have a lot of people that come in um, inbound to Des Moines and they need the feet on the street. They need the connections. They need the person that puts, has the glue that puts it all together in this area. So we do a lot of that. And then, and then occasionally we travel out with our clients as well to other areas. So it's really fun to get to know everybody in the event world. It's just awesome. Awesome. And, uh, you know, you also, for m most people don't know that you also run a second company on top of all this, right? And I if, do, if yeah. If you weren't busy enough, can you tell a little bit about what Event Heroes is and kind of how, what your mission is with Event Heroes? Absolutely. Event Heroes is, you know, my heart. Uh, we had a lot of people come to us and ask us about how to get in the business and how to do what we did. So we started a company to teach them how um, they can do what we do. And it's called Event Heroes. And we just love it. We have so much fun with it. Um, and our goal is to make them the hero for their clients. So it's really turning uh, a wannabe event people into event heroes for their clients. Awesome. And I'm a huge fan yeah. of it, obviously, like with all my superheroes behind me all the time. So <laughs> I'm that heroes from day one. So I love it. Um, <laughs> well, Terry, your, your start was a little bit different. And I think people will want to hear a little bit about what your history is in getting to events. And I like your story is so fascinating. Like every time we hang out and have like a beer or something like that, I feel like I learn like the new, uh, another piece of history from Terry Quick. So Terry, tell me a little bit about what got you in the events industry to today. Um, I actually grew up playing drums and, um, uh, my grandfather was a music teacher. And so when I went to college, I had a music scholarship for performance. And then one thing led to another and I got in a band and after I was out of the military, the Vietnam war, I came back, went to college, <clears throat> got in a group and in the summer we went on the road and I just never went back. So we traveled around and then that big group broke up and then we I was stuck here in Seattle and I met a guy that played guitar and we took off and started doing comedy and fun things like that and that was before comedy was really cool and we were following the big groups back in the late 70s um, in bars and things like that and we'd turn them into a showroom and then move on to the next place and we played all over for about I guess eight years uh, everywhere from Alaska down to Reno and Tahoe and Vegas. And um, then I was actually getting out of the business. I was going to go sell real estate. And on the way, I got a call from the agency that had been booking me that I owed them money. And they, I thought they were trying to collect. And instead, they called me in and asked me to be an agent. So then I went to managing bands and booking, being a booking agent. And then after about 12 years of that, why I left and started producing bands for events and had somebody call me up one day and said, hey, our, our meeting planner quit. We're going to be there in six weeks. Can you carry on and get through it? And that's where I started doing meeting planning and event planning. And so I stayed with them and did that for another 12, 14 years. And so that's where I'm at. That's what I've been doing ever since. That's awesome. That's how Enco started, correct? Yeah, that's how Enco started back in 1986, actually. Awesome. Amazing. Um, and I know we, we talked a little bit about like the balloons and everything like that. <laughs> We're really actively involved with this balloon kind of venture for a little bit. Can you tell everyone a little bit about what that was? That was like really fascinating to me. Well, actually, there was a guy, and he's quite famous. His name is Marvin Hardy, uh, and he wrote most of the books out there on balloon twisting and balloon decor, and anybody that's done done events has probably at some time or another run across Marvin, but he, he was up here in Seattle, and I ran into him. He was working. He'd go out and sit in a bar at night and make balloon animals and handing them out, and he'd make two $300 a night in tips. He was that good. And so I asked him one time if he did decor and he would make these big animals and that sort of thing. And at the time, Seattle had the nickname of being the Emerald City. And so everybody wanted to do um, Wizard of Oz themes. And we were stuck in one of the hotels and I was trying to figure out what to do. I needed a stage backdrop. And so I asked Marvin, I said, well, can we make a, can we make 
an image of the Emerald City out of balloons. And so between the two of us, we figured out. And so he made this image. Uh, it was a, like a dot matrix, basically. And he said, well, yeah, he says we could do it. But he says, I, I don't know how to get the image to transpose it onto the, onto the screen. So I said, well, I used to do needlepoint, and I know there's a needlepoint program out there. If we take the image and turn it into needlepoint, then we'd know how many balloons we need for how far to do it and what color. He says, well, that works. So we put it all together, and we started out there. We built a 12-foot high by 24-foot wide uh, Emerald City backdrop uh, with it, and then I got the brilliant idea of putting lights behind it, and it looked just like it was stained glass. Awesome. So I don't know how many of those we ended up building, but Marvin somewhere along the way went and, and uh, copyrighted the information. As far as I know, he's still doing pretty well with that. <laughs> awesome. awesome. I, I love that story because it's like, I think one of the crazy things, Terry, is that like you have like this diverse background of everything events related, which is what I think makes you so powerful uh, in the industry. Um, I'm curious to know, so then that way, so people have an idea if like they were to hit you up to work for events, can you give everyone an idea of like what kind of services you provide and what your specialities are in? Oh goodness. I've done, I've done all of them. Uh, these days I've tried to cut down or at least stay more local. Um, but I do a lot of hotel no, motel negotiations for that. And because I've got the background for it, it, my feeling is if you've got the right contract with a hotel, it makes it a lot easier to produce your event, especially if you're doing things in the ballroom or that sort of thing. Because it, it's really difficult uh, if you've got a real creative uh, producer, let's say, and they want to do certain things. And if you're stuck with a hotel that requires you to use their in-house production company, that's kind of a non-starter right there, either from a financial standpoint or from a creative standpoint. Um, and it just makes it really hard if the, if the hotel contracts aren't done right. Separately from that, right now, gee, I'm doing, I'm producing an air show for the city of Moses Lake. Uh, next month, I've got a big thing going on with uh, Tacoma Parks Department, who's pretty progressive. Uh, it's, they're one of the first parks departments to have a program specifically for challenged kids. So autistic and physically challenged that sort of thing so they've got a whole series of programs designed just for those kids so they're doing a big big event um in march where they're featuring the disney frozen characters and tying all the entertainment together and they, they're going to have about 3500 kids and families and so it's a big deal and, and apparently it's been watched or being watched by other parks departments around the country to see how successful it's going to be. Very cool. Um, well, I think everyone's curious about, we talked a little bit about CT and obviously with me joining it too, everyone's really curious, like what, why, what brings all three of us together? And so instead of, you know, me telling you my experience, I figure I bring two of the experts on to talk about it, but I want to jump right on in. By the way, before we jump in, uh, shout outs to everyone who's watching right now. Um, I see you guys' messages coming in the chat. Big shout out to Kathy, who's in the chat right now, and also um, Jacqueline in the audience as well. Thank you. She's a first-time viewer. We love first-time viewers. Thank you for joining oh, us. Um, hey, so, woohoo! So, all right, let's jump right on in. So, people want to know what CET is, and what makes it different? So in your own words, uh, we'll start off with Tracy. Tell us a little bit about what you think CET is and what makes it different than an ILEA or an MPI or an HSMI or any association in the events industry, perhaps. Okay, so um, CET is um, a, a creative events team, and we each have our own kind of specialty that we work in, but the thing that really works with this group is working with each other and building our team within the group. So, you know, when I need an AV provider, you know, I'm going to call you. And when I need to book my hotel rooms, I'm going to call Terry because those are your specialties. And that's really what builds a great team. So that's, that's how I see it. But not only that, it's my mastermind group as well. It's the people that think that um, they have the same concerns that I do. And when we start to think about when I need um, mentoring, 
or I need help with a contract or something like that, I know I can really go to these guys and I can really get down and dirty and ask them the questions and I can, um, you know, get kind of open with what I really need or gosh, I really need help with this and I don't understand. And, you know, those are the kind of things I get from it. And frankly, sometimes that's what I need the most. Awesome. It's I like know. the really bounce ideas off of. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Terry got me involved <laughs> many awesome. years well, then, ago. Well, then Terry, you got Tracy. <laughs> He's responsible Tracy got me. Group. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we, we, uh, we, we all work together really closely. Ter Terry's a master at getting people convinced to join things. So if you, if you ever want to just like, talk to someone who can convince you to join <laughs> Thing in your entire life. Ter Terry's the guy I know. Terry, tell everyone. Terry's uh, the guy. <laughs> you've been in the organization since it was called TeamNet all those years ago. Um, right. Tell everyone a little bit about what the group has meant to you and how it's different than other associations for you. Well, I guess going back to when I first heard about the group, um, I got a call from uh, Diane McGarry, who at the time had Axtell Productions in uh, – uh, Atlanta and she talked and talked and talked to get me to join and my my big objection she was saying oh that you know we're all these wonderful things we're ethical we're this that and the other and I said well do you have bylaws set up in a way that suppose somebody isn't that ethical now what can we get rid of them can we charge them you know what what can we do and at the time, I was in uh, MPI and a couple of other groups, and my big objection there is that when you did bring a grievance against somebody, it would take you sometimes years to get a decision. And then even if you did get a decision in your favor, they didn't kick the person out that caused the problem. They would wring their hands and go, oh, wow, if we do that, they might stop paying dues. And so I didn't really feel that that was doing anybody any good. Uh, and it was sort of like empty, empty promises. And finally, one day she called me up and says, okay, if you write the bylaws, will you join? And I said, sure. <laughs> so, I, so you had I, to do work I, and pay to get in. Yeah, I had to pay <laughs> and do the work too. But at least we, we, did, some, we did the bylaws early on. Uh, they had teeth in it. And in all honesty, looking back, those bylaws have saved us more than once because invariably in any yeah. organization, you end up with a tough situation. Somebody has done something that really isn't in the best interest of the group or it's very self-serving or it's detrimental to somebody. And in our case, the bylaws are there. And if you're ruled against on a, on a grievance, there is no choice. You're out of the organization. Um, but they do allow if for some reason you still want to be in the group, then it, they say, okay, if you do this, this, and this, you can come back in, but it takes 90% of all of the partners to vote you back in. And so it, it makes it so that the group has value. And it's the kind of group that once you're into it, uh, it's, it's kind of a convoluted process to get in but after you as you know at once you get in you ask people do you really want to change the process and they go oh no I don't want to change the process this is great so the value is that the group is valuable it's mm -hmm. valuable not only from a mind trust as Tracy has pointed out but financially um, there isn't anybody in the group that doesn't make back many times what they pay annually to be a partner uh, either in new business that they've gained or commissions that they've gotten from referrals or whatever the case may be. Um, in fact, there's a couple of members I talked long and hard enough and I said, look, if you don't get back what you paid in it I, and you want to quit, I'll pay them personally write you a check for it. And so far I've never had to write a check. So. <laughs> pretty awesome Terry actually yeah That's true. well I want to talk a little bit about um, the the structure of it a little bit too because I think so far you know if you if we didn't ever give it a label and call it CET some people might still think okay well how does it differ from uh, MPI and ILEA and I, I want to start to give people like some hard ideas as far as what to expect so you guys call your members partners correct right yes. absolutely right. we're so partners the, can you explain how um, how are, how many partners are there? How they're structured? What sort of industries are people in? 
and how does that work? So I think um, we'll go to you, Terry, um, since you know a lot about the members and you're constantly trying to find new members for the group. Can you talk a little bit about how many members there are for, to start off with? I think that's what really interests, is really interesting. Uh, currently, currently, there's only uh, a dozen members. Uh, we've got some new partners presenting. It's, it's hard to get in. First, you have to be invited, number one. Number two, you can't be a new company. We want everybody that comes in to make us better. So whatever the, the joining partner is or the person that's applying has to bring something to the table that we don't already have. Um, the second thing is that we are not, like there are hundreds of DMC com organizations out there, you know, but they're all DMCs or they're all event producers or they're all whatever. So at bottom line, they're friendly competitors. Mm -hmm. And the, so it, it's always the, well, that's my client. I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to keep my mouth shut, that sort of thing. We don't have that. The partners are really true partners. It is LL, this is an LLC. It's not an association. Every partner that joins owns one share of CET and every partner is equal. So regardless of the size, and we've, we've got some pretty major members, uh, but they're just as important as Tracy is, who's a, a very small company, but they're all equal around that table. And I think that really makes a big difference. And the fact that they're not all from the same industry um, it makes it good. So if you, if you think of a customer or a client as a Christmas turkey, if everybody wants the drumstick, the rest of the thing gets left. Whereas in this organization, some people want drumsticks, some people want thighs, some people want the breast and so on and so forth. So we are able to pick the carcass clean as it were. But the ideal point is, is that we work together on it. Nobody's out trying to poach a client or, or yeah. do whatever. It makes a big difference. We're starting to get a lot of questions in from the audience, which um, I'm going to address some of these as we go along. But uh, to, as a reminder, full disclosure, yes, I am a partner of CET. We're all partners of it. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why I wanted to have this show is to talk a little about the difference that this is from a different organization. So full disclosure, I will definitely answer some questions if people really care about my experience from it, but mainly laying these two kind of talk about it. Um, so uh, that was a question from Aaron Kaufman, who uh, I love that he is asking that question. And then Patty Shock was also asking how large is the group? So as Terry said, 12 members um, in size Perfect. and it's small. And, but that's by design. So Tracy, can you tell a little bit about the partners and what makes up the partners with so Terry's kind of starting to say like how it's this idea of like a turkey, right? Like everyone right. wants a little. <laughs> um, can you talk a little about the composure of the the you know the twelve members? I mean, we're, they're so small that obviously you can probably talk about them all by on a first name and last name basis. Right, right. About what kind of partners and what are the size of these companies? Like, what are what are the people that you're looking for when you're talking to potential partners? Well, when we're talking to potential partners, we're looking for that piece that's missing in that group. And um, frankly, we have a lot of really great pieces already. We have a lot of, um, we have three or four big entertainment companies. Um, we have a staging company out of Canada uh, that has, I, I used one of his stages here in Des Moines, and it was amazing to watch that thing happen. I mean, it just was like a transformant. I loved it. I was really geeking out on it. Um, and then we have, uh, we have people that do um, MC work and, um, and they're an entertainment company as well, but they have their own little niche that they, that they operate in, that they do a really great job in. And then we have people like me who my main focus is decor. So um, if you couldn't tell from the beads behind me, um, that's really where we, where I focus. So I'm looking for more decor people that I can partner with on big events that um, one of my favorite things is to drape very, very large ceilings. And um, I'd always, I'd love to find more people that I can do that with, or that can bring in the table center pieces while I do the ceiling work, things like that so those are the type of people we're looking for but in that group um, we just have we have amazing people um, I'm sure I'm forgetting you, you, you talked so, a little bit about like the the, the service um, diversity of the group too but it's also yeah. about like I've noticed too um, like the geographical diversity too so you talked absolutely. a little bit 
the beginning, like how when people come into Des Moines, we know you as a partner. Can you talk a little bit about how does that work and why is it, how is it structured geographically for all these partners? Are they all in, you know, New York City? Are they all in LA or how does that work? Well, a lot of them are around the coast right now. We're working towards the Midwest. Um, there's very few of us. So come on, Midwesterners, get on board. <laughs> I need just more of you in the Midwest. But um, along the coast, you're, you're in Phoenix. Um, we've got people in, um, I believe, New Orleans. Um, Terry, Terry knows this better than I do where all the, Seattle, the people are located. Uh, Calgary, but, yeah. Yeah. Um, but when they come into Des Moines, they have, a, they have a home in Des Moines. So if you're bringing a client here, you can hang out in my warehouse, you can use my office space, all that kind of stuff to, to have a home base in that area. A lot of us anymore travel with our clients. So if I go to Phoenix, I know that I have your office I can come into and I can hang out and I can get my computer, I can get my stuff printed off, whatever I need. And the other thing, the really important thing is that you're going to know all the people that I need to know to make my event work best. Absolutely. And I like what I found, I think, with the geographicalness of it mm -hmm. is that it forces you to like, even though some of us are in similar industries, we refer business across all the time. Right. And also that you find that, for example, those people want to bring you into their cities too. Um, so like for example, with me, I'm nationwide. So I have a little bit of all over the place. All and the I think generally the partners tend to be kind of nationwide. Everyone's traveling all the time. Yep. Like we we're all addicted to planes. So um, yeah. I think that's where it really helps out too, that like the, you know, when I'm going to Seattle, I can go to Terry and say like, what venues do I need to know? What right. XYZ do I need to know? And everything like that, which is really, really awesome. Absolutely. Um, all right. Um, so, so many questions coming in. Um, so, so we got a question from Patty Shock asking, so this would be for business, not educators or journalists, for example. So can you talk a little bit about, yeah, like, are, are you guys looking for just businesses or, you know, what, what, what is an ideal person like revenue size, size, years in business, all that sort of stuff. Terry, like, who are you looking for when you're trying to develop out the, the, the member base? Well, the main thing, the main thing we're looking for is experience. Um, and like I said earlier, we're, we're not here to validate somebody new as a, you know, if somebody has been in business a year and they want to join us because they think that this is going to validate them as a business. That's not really what we're looking for. We're looking for those experienced planners who understand they've been around the block a few times. They, they, they know what they need. And in today's market, everybody's a planner at one level or another. Um, even you, you do production work, but there's many times where you're helping to actually plan the event or some level of it. And what we've got in our organization right now is we've got um, meeting planning companies uh, legitimate meeting planners that have their own clients. We've got uh, AV companies. Uh, we've got full-on production companies. Uh, two of the entertainment companies that we have that are partners work together in between the two of them. They're probably the largest supplier of corporate event entertainment in the world. And they're doing stuff all over. I mean, Russia, you name it, they've, they've been there. Um, and the other thing that we've got in there, and they've been with us since almost the very beginning, is an organization out of uh, Switzerland called WATA, World Association of Travel Agents. And those folks uh, are probably the oldest organization of their type uh, in Europe. And they're an avid member of our group in the sense that they're just as good for us as we are for them. So if we have a partner that is going overseas. We have the ability to be able to give them somebody over there that speaks English, somebody that's in whatever country they're going to, Poland or whatever, and be able to have somebody with feet on the ground that knows the territory, that knows the people. And that's a huge advantage to anybody when they're trying to, to do an event in an outside area, uh, not only just in the States, but otherwise. Terry, you and I just made this connection for um, an educator here in town that's taking a group over to um, Europe. And between Terry and I, we were able to connect her with um, a meeting planner over there that's able to show that group around. So that was really cool to be able to do that. Yeah, that was an educational group, and they wanted somebody to 
uh, apparently, I think it's a university there in, in yeah. Des Moines, but they're, they are taking students and they wanted somebody over there that could show those students what it was like to do business and what is involved in, in yeah. planning events in a foreign country. So they're addressing everything from security issues to transportation to even something as simple as exchange rates. And so it, it's different when you're working outside of the country. Um, want to kind of address the people who are kind of, uh, so we kind of are addressing like what type of members are there? What's mm -hmm. kind of the value? I think we'll talk a little bit more about value and what's going in it. But um, I think one of the interesting things that makes the organization unique is the, the, the process it takes to become a member. Um, you know, most organizations like ILEA, which uh, as Aaron pointed out, I am um, going, becoming the past president of my local Arizona chapter. Um, still great organization. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of reasons why I join a lot of different organizations. This one's just different. Um, this one, whereas ILEA is, hey, you have a business, you apply, and maybe based on what type of member you are has different rates. CP, it's the same cost for everyone, which um, if Terry and Tracy feel like explaining the cost, and I think that's also a big fact differentiating factor. Um, but the, the process of becoming a member is totally different. You don't just apply and become a member. Mm -mm. There's, there's a process for it, right? And <laughs> Kind of a scary process at first. I remember when Terry was scary process. For the first time. I remember saying, I don't think I have time for this, but luckily yeah. Terry's a hound dog. So Tracy, tell me a little, <laughs> tell everyone a little bit about what does it take to become a member? How do you become a member? What's that process look like? And how do you guys vet people? You know, I think that's very, very interesting differentiator. Yeah. Well, first of all, you have to have been in business for three years. I think I believe that's correct. Terry, correct me if I'm wrong. And then you have to be invited to come to the group and, and we invite you. We kind of party with you a little bit. We get to know you a little bit and then you're invited to fill out an application and the application, like Will said, is long. It's long. We ask a lot of questions. We want to know who's the owner and who's the partner, who the partners are. And we want to know their background and, you what's know, your billing the, process? What's your <laughs> process? Yeah, there's a lot of details. And what we're trying to get to is that it's a legitimate, solid business. It's what we're really trying to get to. That's the that's the deep root of that. The questions that we're asking. And it's not a business that's going to go belly up soon. Um, we're not going to lose a partner because of that. So we're really looking to to see what you're at and to find out what your um, what your uh, code of honor is so to speak and how you operate your business and what kind of uh, clients you have we ask about your clients um, we ask for your portfolio there's a lot and then and then <laughs> I don't know about you will but when I presented it scared the living daylights out of me well before you even present how does it work that because that I mean most people it's apply you get to present right no, that's not how it works no, right no no no, you, no. go ahead Terry <laughs> you 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 when you apply um, the first thing that happens is we get to the application. Um, then I appoint a couple of people, a couple of the partners. They review the application. They vet it, make sure that everything's filled out right. And then it's sent out to the partners. Uh, and they've got what amounts to about two weeks to review it, ask questions, call references. And then it takes, they have to vote. And based on what they see, it takes 80% of the existing partners to say yes. And if they do that, then you're invited to present, uh, at which point you now have to attend one of our two upcoming meetings. Um, we take you out, we get you drunk. Um, <laughs> and then while you've got a hangover, you have to present formally to the group. Uh, and they ask questions, uh, presentations about 15 to 20 minutes and probably about the same number of minutes in Q and A. And then after it's all over, we ask you again, do you still want to be a member of this group? And if the answer is yes, then the partners vote again, but this time it's just the partners that were there for the presentation. And it takes again, 80% of them to say yes, before you become a partner. Uh, so it's a fairly involved process. I think over the years, probably about 40% of the people that apply ever make it. Um, and most of those that come in stay. We have a very low turnover in that regard. And our dues are not that expensive. It's basically $200 a month, uh, paid annually. And 
there isn't anybody that's in the organization that doesn't get that back in real dollars, either business that's sent to them by the other partners or commissions that are paid back and forth for referrals. And Terry, um, that's really important, I think, for you to talk about because, you know, groups like uh, other association groups, when they track, they say like, hey, this is an opportunity to get referrals. They usually, it's, it, it, that's just like a, like a qualitative thing. But right. I think the thing that blew me away, I think you sent this to me and that's how I knew you weren't <laughs> lying when you said you don't make your money back. How, how do you know how much money people are making back from this organization? We require, or at least as much as we can, all of the partners that do business back and forth to let me know and then I track it. So if you give a referral to somebody, uh, usually it's by email and I get CC'd on it and then I track it and go from there. And over the years, it's taken a while to get this going, but uh, as an example, we had something like $3 million in referrals or business opportunities that went back and forth through what amounted to about 14 partners last year. This is 2017. And of that, uh, we picked up, partners picked up just under a million dollars worth of business. So about 30% of all of the referrals going back and forth are actually realized. And I got to say... I've got to say, Terry, that um, that one of the things that's really cool is if I just refer people, if I refer my clients out to Terry or to Will, and I get that commission back, it I may not even be doing the work, which is really awesome. <laughs> that's like mailbox <laughs> money. Bottom line, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's really cool. That's the, uh, that's another way that it differs from other organizations. Yeah, and we keep the commissions deliberately very low, and it's a suggested amount because we're not trying to break the bank. Um, And the idea is that you want to be competitive with anybody else out there. But if you've done really good work for a client in one area, but they're not obviously going to take you where they're traveling next, if you can give that referral to your partner and they can pick up that business and you get a small percentage of the gross back, that's like Tracy says, that's gravy money for basically passing on information. Yeah. And the nice thing about it is that when you get that referral from another partner, you've got some background. You know who the, who the buyer is, you know what they're buying, you know what they're, all of that information that you don't get when you just get these cold call lists. Um, it, it's pretty, pretty bad. So Yeah, it's passing warm leads around actually and, and having referrals. I mean, you can't buy that kind of advertising. For sure. And I think one of the important things is based on your guys' model of vetting people is that when you refer business to, you know that you can trust them. I'm a part of another yeah. organization called Sandbox, which is insanely hard to get into. And it's like, you know, 1% of people get into it, but it's not about business or anything. It's all about personal development, but it's one of those things where it's so vetted, you show up and you meet each other for the first time and it feels like, Hey, I've known these people for a very long time because I can trust them because they've been vetted. And I think that's a really interesting part of the model for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, So many questions to go through. (laughs) All right. Um, So um, to give you guys an idea, so you talked about like only 40% of people who apply. So probably not even 40% of people who even show interest. That's probably even a lower number, but 40% of people apply, um, become members what is a deal breaker to you to someone who you would want in this organization with you? I think that's a great question coming in from the audience because they want to know, you know, like what, what's the standards that you think that makes this so successful? So uh, why don't we kick it off with Tracy? (laughs) A lot of it is personality um, and communication style. I think that we find that very, very important. Um, They have to be able to be believable and you and um trustworthy yeah trustworthy and yeah you just you just want to be able to know that when you send a client off to that person that they're going to be well taken care of so um i think i think for me it's a lot about personality um and then of course the quality of the business what about you terry well i think i think the interesting thing is in the evolution in the early days when we first started it was just you know send in an application and if you're interested and pay the money you're a member but as we as we went through it uh, I can remember one time we 
had this guy apply from New York City. And boy, on paper, this guy was unbelievable. He had a big company, was doing all this stuff. Everybody was really excited. And so we had our meeting and he shows up and everybody about 10 minutes into it, he's talking and everybody's looking at each other and they're going, oh my God, I'd never trust my client with this guy. So that's when we instituted the second step, which is after they make the presentation, we then ask if you still want to be a partner and then they have one more try to determine whether or not you'd be a, be a partner. The other thing that is unique, and I think this is the big thing, is that if if you join MPI, uh, you've got wannabe meeting planners, you've got secretaries who are, would love to plan the, the parties for the boss. There's really no quality control. There's not really anything there, but it, it doesn't make them a bad person, but it doesn't necessarily really give you any kind of a serious feel for how good these people are. On the other side of the coin, for CET, all of the active members are the owners or the senior managers of the company that they're part of. So if we have a big multinational company, it's the senior vice president for marketing or it's the senior vice president for this or that or the other that attends the meetings. So when you come to our meetings, you're dealing with the horse's mouth. You're not dealing with the flavor of the month salesperson or anything like that. And that doesn't mean that we discourage the salespeople or whoever from, from participating. In fact, we very much encourage that, but the decision maker is there. So if we make a decision that we're going to attend this trade show or we're going to do some specific thing, the partners vote for it and it happens right there. We don't have to wait for somebody to go back and then try and sell it to the boss before the decision's made. And that's key is I think that having the, the decision makers there, they're participating, it's all part and parcel to the whole thing. And the other thing that's really interesting and I think it speaks to the success of the group is that partners, we have two meetings a year, one in the spring, one in the fall because everybody's busy and it's really hard to get to these meetings. But interestingly enough, most of the partners try and make both meetings, even though they only are required to be at one, it's like they feel like somebody's trying to pull their teeth if they don't make it to that meeting because they're afraid they're gonna miss something. Yeah, they're Especially missing out. <laughs> two weeks, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so you talked a little bit about like the two meetings per year and that's we're leading into another question um, coming from the audience is they want to know how are you, a couple questions coming from different people basically saying how do you with only two meetings a year keep the camaraderie and then also keep it so you continually do business because you're only seeing each other twice a year. You know, Tracy, can you talk a little bit about like how does the group stay in, in so close with only seeing each other twice a year? Well, um, we have a board and the board stays really close and communicates through um, email, but then a lot of our members are calling and talking to each other. Um, well, you and I just served on a, on a, a speaker's uh, panel for the special events and that is another way that we stay in, in touch with each other and wow, was that awesome. I got, to know, I got to know some of our members so much better because I had personal one-on-one -on -one time with them. Um, in New Orleans and we just, you know, ate and drank and it was awesome. And, um, and so it's, it's, it's more than just those two meetings. There's there. Um, I, I know a lot of the board members are calling each other weekly. Um, I'm talking to a Nicole in, in, uh, from, from San Francisco. I'm talking to her a lot because she and I have some things going. So it, it, we're not just, it's not just those two meetings. There's so much going on in the group and we really stay pretty active. I talk to Terry a lot. <laughs> Terry's really good at keeping track of everybody and, and keeping up with everybody. So, so there's a lot, there's a lot of friends, great friendships um, going on in the group as well. It's, it's not just all business. There's a lot of great friendships that are being forged. Awesome. What about you, Terry? Like, how do you keep the relationships going year round? Well, I think my pet peeve is I hate texting and I hate email <laughs> in the sense that I've got clients <laughs> who come to me and they, you know, I get these, these innocuous emails from people and say, okay, we're going to have an event in Seattle. How much is a comedian? <laughs> no phone number. 
no, no anything. They've just got an email address to come back to. And I'm going, well, I don't know, sweetheart. How much is a car? <laughs> you know, I mean, give me a break. Give me some detail. Give me some information. And that's the key with this group. They actually answer their phones. They actually talk to each other. They actually fully engage. And I think that's really the key. You, you can't you can't be in this industry. This is a personality person industry and you cannot do it long distance. You can't call in your answers. You can't automate it and push a button and have it happen. Not if you're any good at it. And these people understand that, you know, and we've got young guys like you in here and we've got old people in here like me and the con, con you know, the confluence is very good. I think it's kind of the best of both worlds. We got the technological, but we also have the ability to really communicate. And, and that's a value that you can't buy. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it is what it is. And we try very hard in the selection process. And I think somebody asked there, where do we look for people? Well, we have it geographically. Uh, we kind of broke the country down many, many, many years ago and said, well, we can take so many people in this city and so many people in that city. But we try very hard not, the, the whole point is not to create competition. We want to create cooperation. So if we have an existing partner in a city, we aren't going to take somebody else in there that would be competition. They, they would have to be somebody that would play nicely in the sandbox, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Um, it sounds like too, like, I mean, one of the things I've kind of realized is that you get what you put into it too, right? Like with any organization, Absolutely. right? People say that about every organization, you know, get on the board, get active, get involved. But one of the simple things that I found is since I'm doing events all over the country and flying around, which a lot of the partners are doing mm -hmm. is that just as simple as if I'm in San Diego, I hit up, you know, Balada and I hit up Nicole and I say hi to them yeah. and I stop by and have lunch. And, you know, I say hi to Anthony and I say hi to Judy and I say hi to Nicole and Mark and everybody down there. Um, and then when I'm in San Francisco next week, I'm going to hit up Peter and hang out with Peter's crew and you getting that FaceTime, even if it's just getting lunch. Oh, bless you. Woo. Thank you. That's the first time I think I've ever sneezed on the podcast. <laughs> recording of all time. Would you turn your mouse the other way, please? Thank you. Um, <laughs> the, um, the one thing I've realized is that it definitely, you get what you put into it. And even that Absolutely. I'm really, really helps. Um, all right, we don't have a lot of time left. I think I have one more question before we go into our standard last two questions. Um, so um, let's go with, oh my gosh, there's so many more. I guess um, to give an idea, um, you talked a little bit about you know, the, what you're looking for. Um, if someone is interested in joining the group, what is the best way for them to do it? And what would be your tips for them to joining a group like this? Um, and I will, all, then I have, I have a follow-up question, a better question that I actually want to end on. So what would be your tips if someone wanted to join an organization like this? I guess they could get in touch with one of us and get the process started. <laughs> <laughs> well, even maybe about the process, like what would you recommend through the process for, you know, if you're, even if they're not joining a CET, maybe they're joining like a really right. exclusive mastermind group, you know, what would be your recommendations for an exclusive group like this? Um, really check out the group and see if that's where you want to be, where you want to put yourself. Um, get to know the members. Look them up. They're all online. You can find who they are. Uh, understand how the group is put together and why it's put together before you um, decide whether you want to be involved. Uh, those, are, those are some really important top tips for looking at groups that you want to join. I like it. Terry, what about you? What would be your tips for like if someone wanted to join a group similar to this or like this or yeah, this exact group, what would be your, your tips for them? Well, I think the biggest, the biggest thing that we look for, I mean, if you talk to the partners, um, they all say, well, what is this person going to do to make us better? And if, if you're going to join a group, I'm, I, and I would think any group, they're gonna basically ask the same question. So it's not about what can you get out of it, it's about what can you do to make them better. And, and I think the more that you can emphasize what you, you bring to the table that would, that would complete the group as a whole, that has more value than, gee, I did this event and I made this a million dollars and I did this and I did that. Mm, interesting. 
I like it. All right. So my last question I have for you guys before we do our standard, my favorite last two questions ever. Um, if So we talked a little bit about, I think, pre-show, and I meant, wanted to bring this up because I think you brought up a really good point, Tracy, is that, you know, even if you aren't necessarily looking at joining CET, you can kind of do this on your own if you wanted to, right? Create this kind of like mastermind group. What would be your guys' recommendations for if someone wanted to start a group like this, how would they do it on their own and kind of get it started if they want to? I know that's a, almost a topic in itself. So <laughs> it I, is. Very to carefully, I think, is really the right answer, Will. <laughs> well, actually, um, for, for us, I always call it the bullets in my belt. And every time I meet somebody, we just had an event here in our in our warehouse this weekend and every time I meet someone I find something that I can connect with them to see if maybe I have something that my that I that they have that my clients might be interested in I'm, it's all about taking care of your clients ultimately so when you have those bullets in your belt then you can always pull one of those out when you need it to get to your client um, you know you might have your a client that wants a certain uh, for us it might be a, a certain kind of acrylic uh, centerpiece. Well, I've got to find somebody that can custom make acrylic centerpieces. Where am I going to find that? So they're all team members. They all become team members of mine. Um, I know where I can find the unique and wonderful things that my clients have seen at Pinterest or something like that um, with, with all of the people that I communicate with on an oral basis. I love it. I think that's just good advice in general. Is, yeah, yeah, being help, be helpful for your client. Always be looking to connect with people. So you always have that ability when someone asks for something and say, yeah, I know where to get that. That's, that's awesome advice. Terry, you know, what it about makes you? Me, I'm oh, sorry. It makes go me ahead. the expert and I get to, you know, I get to keep the, keep the client that way. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. Tra Terry, what about you? What would be your like one tip for someone who wanted to start their own group or do something similar to what, what CET is? I think the, the biggest thing is that you've got to take a look at it and, and recognize that not everybody is an expert at everything in spite of the one-stop shop and all of that kind of stuff that you see all the time. The reality is that it takes a lot of experts in a lot of different fields to be able to bring an event together. And I don't care if you're talking about a wedding or a birthday party or for that matter, you know, one of the big events that some of us are doing it still takes a team and the you have to have respect for what the other guy is doing uh you have to have respect for the fact that they're they deserve a fair compensation for that work they can't all work for you for nothing and then you take all the stuff and so and i think that's the big thing about our group is they recognize that when they're working in, a, in an environment with other partners those other partners bring things to the table that make it easier for them to do what they do and they can therefore do it cheaper individually if they cooperate and everybody walks away with with a, a reasonable profit on the thing and the benefit at the very end is the the customer or the client awesome so i think that having that rec recognition is is key and it takes a long time to build that trust by the way absolutely um, I think both great advice for just business in general, for sure. Um, well, I'm hoping we don't go too much over time, but we got to go into our last two final questions. Shout outs to everybody who was asking questions during the entire show. Um, absolutely awesome. But last two questions we have that we always end every show with. First of all, what is your one tip for event planners when planning events in 2018? It can be group related. It can be pretty much about anything. Uh, you guys already dropped some good event planning bombs already so i apologize if i if that was a good that was the one you wanted to use but go ahead with your one tip <laughs> tracy <laughs> communication Anything? communicate with me often and um, let's talk through the program and let's communicate with the whole team so communication 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 awesome. that's my tip <laughs> i love it simple but good terry yeah. what is your one tip answer your phone <laughs> it's the single most important Not resource for, me, any, for everybody else. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm talking about everybody else. It, it, the phone is the single most important resource any planner has. And unfortunately, they use it for everything except what it was actually designed for. <laughs> and they, they text with it. They do all of this other stuff. But it takes hours, if not days, to answer a question. Pick up the phone. Answer the phone set up your voicemail so you can get messages. I can't tell you how many times I call and I listen to this long drawn out message and then the, the users never set up their voicemail. Oh. 
So what's the point? I mean, it's like the hotels, they spend thousands and thousands of dollars to send these, these salespeople all over the world to go get new business. And so the client calls up and nobody picks up the phone. So, you know, do the, do the obvious. Sometimes the obvious is the most simple and the most effective way to get new business and to move ahead. Answer the phone. <laughs> I love how both of yours tie into communication, which is yeah. fantastic. All right, I'm gonna to try to get us done in time. So okay. we're gonna jump into resources. So whether books, blogs, a cool new app, a cool new piece of t technology you're playing with, really anything, or it can be, as I know Terry's got some old school resources, um, share your favorite stuff that you are finding right now or that you're using every single day or that you've recently found. So uh, Tracy, why don't you kick us off with your favorite resources? Okay, one of my favorite ones is um, Build Your Brand Story. Uh, this is a new one for me and um, I'm finding that it works for my advertising, but it also works for every single event I do. The, the information in there, it's by Donald Miller, I believe. It, the information in there is phenomenal to build that story from the beginning of the event to the end of the event and um, to really concentrate on your cause. So it works not only for business, for building your clientele and learning how to build, bring in business, but also for your events. Awesome. Any other resources you want to share? Um, oh, there's so many. Um, <laughs> um, I know I, I have one fa another favorite book called The Fred Factor, and it's all about customer relationships. And I love, love, love that book. Um, I hand it to everybody that I see. So that's another one of my fun ones. So mine are awesome. both books this time. And where, can, where would people go to get some of the awesome resources that I know that you have at Event Heroes? Oh, at Event Heroes, eventheroes.com. And um, they can actually look in our shop at Innovative Events, which is spelled with one E in the middle, um, all one word. And at the top, there's a shop and you can find some, some fun resources there. You can also find some theme parties that you can purchase. They're already done for you. Excellent. I like making my life easier for sure. Yeah. Terry, what about you? What, what resources do you got to drop for everybody? What are your favorite resources? Well, for technology, Will, I, you're hard to beat. So I, <laughs> if I have a question about technology, you're my first call. Um, secondly, I'm old school, and that is uh, my favorite book is All That I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. And um, I think every budding meeting and event planners should go back and read that. Um, and like I say, they, they probably will end up learning how to play nicely in the sandbox because that's the secret to doing any event. And if anybody is interested in contacting us about CET or becoming a partner, uh, they can go to the creative event team website and there is a link there and just put in your information. I'll be happy to get back to them anytime. Let me guess, you're going to call him. <laughs> I will call him, absolutely. I'll make sure the phone number works, by the way. Awesome. Well, I know I didn't talk a lot about my experiences, which was kind of the goal of this podcast, but if you guys ever want to hear my experience with CET too, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you guys all know where to find me, thankfully. Um, I'm eventually never going to be able to hide from the world, but we have ran out of time. So I do have to give a huge thank you to Terry and Tracy for sharing your experiences and a little bit about um, just a different organization. You know, we're always featuring different organizations on here. It was so awesome to have both of you on here kind of talking about what you've experienced and how it differs from the other organizations you've met. Yeah. You've ever thank you, so, Will. Thanks, thank Will. You. Appreciate it. You guys are awesome. All right. Well, everybody, a big thank you to you too for tuning in. Don't tune out quite yet because we got some more awesome stuff left over, but be sure to tune in next week. We got another amazing episode. And don't forget, you can always ask questions. And believe it or not, if you subscribe today at www.event-icons.com, you'll get an invite to our exclusive Facebook group. These guys are in it. So you can continue asking them questions. Um, and also all of our guests, everyone from the planners of South by Southwest, people from Biz Bash, these guys, amazing guys, everyone is in there. So you want to be invited to that. You just got to go to event-icons.com and then subscribe and you'll get an email invitation right away. So go check that out, that's pretty awesome. But time has run out. It's been another amazing hour on Wednesdays at 5 p.m. Eastern. We gotta get out of here. Thank you everybody for tuning in and we will see you all next week on Event Icons. 
thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Hashtag Event Icons. To catch the transcription and all of the resources mentioned, head to www.helloendless.com slash blog. This week's episode will be posted and available by next Tuesday. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode. Share your biggest takeaway and join the social conversation sponsored by Little Bird Told Media. Just tag your post with hashtag event icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern right here on hashtag event icons.